Okay, I had a really cool idea more than 20 years ago to make some, to create some transgenic fish that would be able to detect uh, pollution of water that we drink. And as you all know, uh, there are more than uh, tens of thousands of toxic waste dump sites, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, herbicides that are dumped into the soil, 75,000 chemicals each year, many of them new chemicals. They all leach through the groundwater, and they all, uh, through the ground, to the water, and eventually they all uh, reach our drinking water, and they uh, will be taken up by fish, and uh, as the end of the food chain, humans will be eating these fish and drinking this water. So uh, here's a real life situation to, to explain what we'd like to do. Uh, 25 miles east of Cincinnati is Lake Harsha, which is the water, drinking water supply for more than 60,000 residents of Claremont County. And the more than 10 miles to the east of this uh, lake is a chemical company which uh, is now bankrupt and uh, is no longer ex exists. But during several decades, they dumped thousands of gallons of PCBs, which are carcinogenic, toxigenic, uh, cause birth defects and everything, into the ground. A lot of the uh, PCB liquid was just uh, un, un, in, without containers. Some were put in barrels and buried in the ground. And uh, these barrels obviously are going to be rusting. The chemicals in the brown, ground are going to be going deeper and seeping into the groundwater. And eventually we'll be coming down Pleasant Run Creek into the East Fork of the Miami, Little Miami River and uh, enter the possibility of entering the drinking water supply. So wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of detection system between the source of the pollution and the drinking water supply for so many people? I might add that one coffee cup full of PCBs dumped in the middle of Lake Harsha and stirred around would destroy all life in, in the lake. It's that potent. So this is sort of like having a canary in a mine, an early detection system before uh, there's pollution downstream, so we'd know uh, when does the pollution start, how bad is it, what is the rate of increase, and so on. So uh, we chose a zebrafish, which is a very hardy fish. It's about the size of a guppy. Uh, in the early 70s, this fish was uh, picked up in the streams of uh, India and brought to University of Oregon in Eugene where they have a zebrafish colony and now this is a very popular fish used in developmental biology studies because they can make a transparent fish and you can see development occurring in the fish. Uh, the other nice thing about this is they live as long as five years. So this is uh, mouse lives uh, two or three years which is what I usually work with. Uh, and uh, so genes are made up of DNA, and the genes are strung on all of our chromosomes, pretty much like uh, so many pearls on a string. And uh, in the 80s, it became obvious that you could take a gene from one species and be able to express it in the cells of another species, and vice versa. So you could take a yeast gene and put it into human cells and express it as a yeast gene and it would interact with other, uh, the protein would interact with various uh, proteins of the human uh, cells, and uh, vice versa. You could take a human gene and put it in bacteria or yeast and get it, it to express. So we had the idea around 1988 that we would take a gene from jellyfish and micro-inject that into fertilized zebrafish eggs. Uh, the gene becomes integrated through uh, into the DNA, and then this would be expressed uh, in the zebrafish as it grows up. <clears throat> and the other thing that became clear in the 1980s is that near each gene, there are different modular units which are able to turn on the gene. So uh, one, one such thing was the metal response element, so cadmium or nickel or cobalt, uh, very seriously uh, toxic heavy metals, will uh, bind to a, chem to a protein bind to this DNA binding site near the gene and turn on the gene, upregulate the gene. Likewise, there's an aromatic hydrocarbon response elements and uh, chemicals in cigarette smoke, toxic um, well, PCBs, oil slicks, combustion processes of all sorts. Uh, this will, again, bind to some proteins, interact with the DNA there, and turn on the gene. Then it, uh, another 
part of this equation is a very classic experiment in 1957. B.B. Uh, Brody put a uh, 10 millimolar solution of a tranquilizer uh, into three different sized vessels and then added a goldfish to each vessel and demonstrated that the goldfish in the large vessel, vessel uh, died almost immediately. The one in the smaller intermediate vessel uh, was sort of stunned and the one uh, in the smallest vessel was basically healthy. So what does this tell us? Well, this is the uh, discovery of bioconcentration. The fish, for uh, reasons I won't go into, can take very s small number of molecules in the water and bioconcentrate it inside its body up to a factor of 10,000, 1,000 to 10,000 fold. So uh, we had a federal grant for four years in the 90s, and uh, with the help of Mike Carvan and D Tim Dalton in the lab, we uh, generated zebrafish, exposed them to pollutants in the water. They would in turn interact with these, these uh, response elements, turn on the green fluorescent protein gene in the, the zebrafish. The zebrafish would glow, uh, and the amount of glowing or the amount of fluorescence would be directly proportional to the level of pollutant that the fish was originally exposed to. The uh, really neat thing is that the zebrafish then can swim around for a couple of days in clean water, detox itself, and you're able to use the thing again for four or five years. Uh, these are some examples of, uh, on the upper right is a dark, dark field uh, uh, histology. You can see the uh, uh, fish are wrapped around here, this four-day-old fish with the eye down here. Uh, and uh, in the presence of cadmium exposure, there's a lot of uh, fluorescence here which can be picked up in a cubet with a, with a flor uh, fluoroscopic, uh, fluorometric uh, determination system. A six-day-old fish with dioxin exposure, here's the fish lighting up and the yolk sac is degenerating at this point. And here's PCB exposure, 25-day-old fish, and you can see the level of uh, fluorescence. So uh, what's next? I don't have any businessman genes. If I wanted to make money, I would have been a heart surgeon. <laughs> so uh, what we need is an entrepreneur. I've had several offers of venture capital money from Germany and, and England. Uh, Maybe you need to pay the salaries of uh, two uh, molecular cloning experts who are good with their hands in the lab. A zebrafish facility is very, very trivial. You can, you can have a thousand fish in about 200 square feet. You need a microinjection apparatus, which is not very expensive. And then you can sell these fish worldwide to detect water uh, pollution, similar to the situation in Lake Harsha. And then as an aside, you can probably run the, the entire business on the money that you make by making green, yellow, blue, and red, all these uh, genes are now available from different uh, uh, marine biology organisms. So you can turn these things on, people can buy these for their home aquariums, and the fish just looks normal, and then you turn the uh, fluorescent light on the tank, and they suddenly glow red, yellow, green, blue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>